So my name is Manon Wolfkamp and I am the legislative coordinator of the MVO platform. And the MVO platform is a network of around 25 civil society organizations like trade unions and, and uh, NGOs and research institutions. And we all work on responsible business conduct uh, in the Netherlands. Yeah, we feel that very complimentary. So uh, first of all, I think the basis of any law, regardless whether it's national, European, um, uh, or even international law, should be based on the OECD guidelines and the UNDPs. So the UNDPs are the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, which were adopted by UN in 2011 uh, worldwide. Everybody endorsed these principles um, uh, from production countries to uh, European countries or or uh, United States, big companies, small companies, civil society, everybody endorsed these principles and said, this is the way forward to hold business accountable for uh, human rights impacts in, in, the, in their entire value chain. And um, so the OECD guidelines were then revised to include the UNDPs. So the concept of due diligence, which is a central con concept within the uh, UNDPs, Due diligence for human rights was actually adopted by the by the OECD, and within the OECD guidelines, it was actually extended also to environment. But OECD guidelines is is really the basic of any piece of legislation that should be developed uh, internationally and nationally, um, and we feel that the European um, law, as it is proposed now by by uh, by the Commission, but also the Council compromise that was um, adopted in December, both don't really live up to that expectation. So yes, they are loosely based on the OECD guidelines, but then they really um, don't, they really take bits and pieces out of the OECD guidelines, which makes the whole house of cards fall down because it's a really carefully designed house of cards, uh, and you can't just include some element, elements, but then not include others. And I think the national law, which was introduced in the Netherlands, really is in line with the OECD guidelines, and it will therefore have a, a greater impact. Um, so if you adhere to the OECD guidelines, if you implement the OECD guidelines, you have nothing to worry about, because the European law, the German law, the French law, the Dutch law, they're all based on these OECD guidelines, and you will um, fulfill your obligations. <laughs> So I think it's important to realize that the Dutch initiative law was already um, first submitted before there was a European law submitted. So this was already in March 2021. Um, and this has been a process. I mean, I've been involved with this process already since 2016, actually, when there was a first extra meeting on what Dutch due diligence legislation could actually look like. So it was an outcome of a very long and intense process and with a lot of multi-stakeholder um, consultations. Um, and the redrafting of their current draft, they really carefully looked at the European proposal and checked whether, for example, climate was not a, a separate topic in the Dutch in the first draft of the law. And they added climate because climate is a separate article in the European law. So they added climate to the Dutch law, um, but it took it a step further. So in the, in the European proposal, it says that companies should have a climate plan. But it's great to have a plan, but a plan is of no use if you don't have to implement it. So this, the Dutch law actually says that a plan needs to be implemented <laughs> and, and it needs to fulfill certain criteria. It cannot just be any plan. It should be a really good plan for climate. So it needs to be in line with the Paris Agreement, for example. Uh, of course, then you could say, let's let's hold the Dutch process and wait for the European process. Um, but then there are two problems. First of all, as I well, as discussed before, the European um, uh, proposed law is not ambitious enough. It's not aligned enough with the uh, OECD guidelines. To give you a few concrete examples, first of all, the European uh, law as proposed by the Commission focuses on established business relationships. Well, due diligence should be done for all of your business relationships. The business relationship doesn't define priorities. It's actually the risks. It should be a risk-based approach. So the, the risks, the impact, the potential impact should actually define where you you um, your where you start in your due diligence process. 
Um, so this is a very important and crucial distinction uh, between the OECD guidelines and the European proposal and now the Dutch proposal, which actually includes this risk-based uh, approach. So yes, I think it's very important that we show that it is actually possible to have a decent law based on the OECD guidelines uh, that, that doesn't just entail paperwork for companies, but it actually really leads to impact um, in production countries, which is why you want to have this law in the first place. So I think the biggest problem is that a lot of the abuses that occur, like underpayment and so non-payment of living wages or uh, living income, which really leads to poverty, which is a root cause of a lot of uh, human rights violations like child labor, for example, or long working hours without compensation and freedom from association is a big issue in a lot of countries, but also uh, um, in, uh, environmental issues like uh, using a lot of water, plantations using a lot of water, uh, and surrounding communities don't have enough water anymore to water their own plots and pieces of land. So there are really a lot of problems that come with the production of goods. Uh, um, what we see now is that for the, the companies importing these products into Europe and selling these products in Europe, is that these negative impacts are far away, far away from the European market. They are really in production countries. They are in the countries where these big banana plantations are, or big cocoa farmers or smallholder farmers on cocoa are, where the cocoa is actually produced or where these huge factories are, where all of our clothing is made. These are all outside of, mostly outside of Europe. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, the, the quite strong labor laws that we have in Europe are not upheld uh, by these same companies in their supply chain. Um, and we feel they should respect human rights and environment in their entire value chain, not just when they produce in Europe, but also when they buy from producers from other countries. Um, and we're not alone in this, of course. I mean, this is the whole idea behind the UNDPs and the, uh, the OECD guidelines. So this is really internationally accepted right now that, that you are responsible for your entire value chain um, in, in, and, not, and not fully responsible. Yeah? There's a difference in, in if it's your own factory that causes these these abuses, or whether it's a factory from from one of your suppliers, you have a different responsibility, but you still have a responsibility. And for example, in cocoa, um, uh, due, due to inflation and the rising of costs in, in the past year, also cocoa farmers uh, experienced more poverty. It was even more difficult for them to, to actually survive. So a, a Dutch chocolate company said, okay, we will hire, we, again, we will raise our price for cocoa farmers to make sure that they, they actually earn a living income. And they said, we will open up our whole chain, our sourcing chain, open up to others. So they actually took other big chocolate companies with them uh, and together, of course, have a lot bigger impact in the entire value chain. And this is an example of what the law asks from companies to do. So to make sure that in their purchasing practices, they think, OK, is this decision I'm making right now? Is this really a fair decision? Can I ask this from suppliers? Am I paying enough? to actually make sure that the supplier can respect human rights um, uh, and the environment. And of course they can prioritize uh, because uh, some companies have thousands of suppliers, they need to prioritize, but they should prioritize uh, on where the impacts are severest. So every company will find negative impacts on human rights, environment and the climate in their value chain, no exception. There are no 100% clean or good, right value chains. So the problem is not the fact that you find them. Actually, it's a bigger problem if you don't find them because then you're not actively looking for them. But the, the fact that you find them actually says that you're working on it. And then um, if you decide to do nothing with your findings, then you are in trouble. And then you don't uh, comply with the law. But if you find them and actually work with them and try to solve these abuses, then you abide by the law. I think that's an excellent question. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we've been experiencing a lot of backlash. So uh, we thought we had kind of tackled the question whether that legislation was actually necessary because there's a lot of research. There's a lot of research done that, uh, I mean, they, they work in a sense that they provide with inter interesting instruments and interesting examples of how due diligence could actually work in practice. But then there are not enough companies to actually participate in these uh, in these initiatives uh, to actually have the impact they could have. And, and then, but then when this initiative law was launched in the Netherlands, after a few weeks, there was a huge backlash by 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 major international companies that were threatening to leave the Netherlands if this law was ever adopted. 
Uh, and this was echoed by the uh, employers organization and they they used examples that were actually really false and and not true um for example they said that you could be jailed if one of your su suppliers of, if suppliers of suppliers were doing something wrong in one of the production companies which is so not true and it's not nor in this whole piece of law and that was actually really surprising we weren't prepared for this we knew we would have an intense conversation on the content of the law and that we might have to change certain articles and that and that we, we we probably would have to lower the ambition of the law but we never expected the game to be played so dirty so out in the open um and it really felt like we were going back in time and and this was then again the backlash that happened to them as well huh? so there were many people that then said well hey come on really if you don't want to do business in a responsible way, then please just leave the Netherlands off you go, right? So it polarized the discussions from both sides that encounter because it's not easy. We all understand it's not easy for business to actually have these conversations with their suppliers on uh, human rights um, and environmental impact. So yes, we understand it's not easy, but at least open up and try. And I think that's what this piece of legislation is asking. Um, that each company uses its own influence to change circumstances in the in the supply chain, in the value chain, and really depending on the size of the company, the 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 place you have in the value chain, but also on the uh, extent or the the um, significant significance or severity of the negative impact you have, it really depends on how much influence you should actually use in, and how much responsibility you have for these impacts. Um, but I think the law really allows companies to start this conversation. They don't have to be perfect from the get-go. The law really um, is the, the main um, enforcement mechanism in the law is a, a public uh, supervisory authority. And this supervisory authority in the law is really uh, asked to focus on improving the capacity of companies to actually do responsible business conduct. So they won't start fining uh, immediately, they will start having conversations and they will start asking, how can we help? How can we together make sure that your your value chain is really improves um, for everyone in the value chain? We believe the Dutch law is very ambitious um, in the sense that it, it the core of the law is the six steps of due diligence. And all of these six steps are uh, are detailed in the law. Uh, also remedy, which we feel, access to remedy, which we feel is a really crucial uh, part of, of due diligence and actually really would improve access uh, to justice even for, for victims. Huh? So access to uh, remedy and extra justice for us is very closely uh, related. You, justice is not always necessarily, um, uh, doesn't always need to go to court. You can also get justice through, uh, through non-judicial measures, which I think is part of the uh, of step six of remedy. So I think in that sense, the law is quite ambitious. It, it's quite ambitious that it has through three different enforcement regimes. The most important one, as I said, is, is the public enforcement uh, of this law. Um, and public enforcement in the Netherlands, um, it, it's quite well uh, arranged. So they have quite some capacity, quite some power actually to do research and quite some possibilities to uh, to escalate uh, matters. So uh, it really starts with a conversation and then maybe a warning and then maybe a fine. And then, you know, and it really, it, it escalates to, to different levels, uh, which I think is well um, organized. Um, but of course, hopefully we'll never come to the finding stage um, and we'll make sure that it happens before. And then the other uh, second enforcement um, is civil liability, uh, which is possible in the Netherlands anyhow. We don't need this law for civil liability, but it's in there. There are also some uh, measures in there that would actually improve access to justice, to formal justice for victims in the Netherlands through civil liability cases, which is important. Um, and uh, lastly, there is a, a criminal liability enforcement in there. Uh, but it's only on reporting. So it's only if if the um, company does not report, it's uh, criminally liable. So there are three different enforcement regimes and the six steps of the OC guidelines are included in the law, which we believe makes the law quite ambitious. Also, the threshold from companies that need to do due diligence are, are either, either have 250 or more employees and or a balance sheet total of 20 million and or a uh, a net uh, a turnover of 50, 40 million uh, euros, which is also quite ambitious compared to other countries. It's the same as the CSRD, basically the same requirements as the 
the Corporate uh, Sustainability Reporting Directive. If you are an SME, or even if you have 250 or more, uh, if, if you're a large company, but a small, large company, and you have thousands of suppliers, it's not easy to start, right? So we have to, we also make need to make sure that these companies have instruments that they can actually do due diligence and they understand what they need to do and that they are actually... Um, uh, that they have positive incentives to start doing. And, and also where I think we can find each other is that it's it's all, it's now portrayed as if doing business in a responsible way is very costly and will really lead to a, uh, a bad business environment for companies. Well, we also believe that doing business in a responsible way can actually bring a lot to companies as well, really a lot of benefits. <laughs> Yes, we do feel that if companies start doing business this way, it, it would be beneficial for companies themselves uh, as well. Um, I mentioned an, an example of, of cocoa and, and living wage and paying living wage in, in cocoa. We all know that a cocoa, and I think this is why one of the reasons why the cocoa, uh, 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 cocoa companies are also a little bit at the, at the front of, of progressive business pleading for, for ambitious legislation in, in Europe is that cocoa, there's a big, there will be due to climate change and due to, to uh, really bad circumstances for farmers in the cocoa supply chain, there might be a shortage of cocoa at some point. Yeah? Because cocoa farmers cannot produce cocoa anymore because of climate change, but also because they don't earn enough. So they just move on to other products, which is also really a problem, of course, for cocoa companies. So to make sure that they are still guaranteed with this input of co cocoa beans, they need to make sure that they treat their farmers well, so that farmers are actually um, uh, have an incentive to stay in the cocoa business, and they need to help cocoa farmers with adjusting to climate change. Um, and, and, and you see this happening uh, on a small scale. It should be more, it should of course be uh, be more uh, grander. But you see this happening. I think that really helps in ensuring stable a stable influx of cocoa beans for for cocoa companies. So in this sense, it's also good for for business to actually. Uh, do business in a responsible uh, way. I think it's also something that consumers are asking for. 83% uh, of the Dutch public wants uh, ambitious legislation on, on responsible business conduct. So consumers are demanding fair product. They don't want to eat a chocolate bar that has been produced by children or, or where people have been paid uh, below living wages. Um, and there's more and more awareness of this happening, especially with young, the younger generation. And also... Uh, for um, uh, it's more difficult. I think it's easier for companies that do uh, business in a responsible way to actually attract the right people as uh, in their business as personnel. They want to hire people. They want to have good staff, and and people are more motivated, especially younger generations, more motivated to work for a business that actually sees its uh, actually takes its responsibility and takes up its role as a business in in uh, in actually improving conditions in the whole supply chain. So I think these are some of the benefits for, for companies in doing responsible business conduct.